Uh, but he's actually come to us from Vienna where he was giving a tour. No? <laughs> Brussels. <laughs> I'm sorry, my notes. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he originally was a C programmer and fell in love with Ruby quite early on and has been programming in Ruby since 2012. He's a developer at Red Hat. Uh, he's given talks in Vienna. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have that on my notes. Uh, Vienna, in Brno, uh, in Albania, and he's come all the way from about a negative 15 degree weather, where, well, I mean, maybe not quite that cold, but it's cold and it's snowy, and he's come all the way to this horrible, hot, humid weather in Melbourne to talk to all of us about uh, sockets and HTTP connections. Please welcome David. Can I get the clicker? No problem. So, hi everyone. My name is David. Uh, you can find me on Twitter under my full name or on GitHub as Kateman. And my talk is about uh, hijacking, proxying, and smuggling sockets with Ruby. I came from the Czech Republic. I live in a town called Brno, which is famous for beer and MotoGP. It looks like this, but actually it looked like this when I left. <laughs> so I'm a software engineer working for Red Hat. I do open source and only open source. I work on the Manage IQ project. <laughs> uh, it's an open source management platform for hybrid infrastructures. So if you have a cloud, we can manage it. And one of the features I'm working on is called in-browser remote consoles. So if you have a pool of virtual machines, you can open one and uh, have a pop-up window with a VNC session to its screen, its virtual screen. Uh, it works in a really simple way. You have the browser and the VM. The VM runs on a hypervisor, which provides you the service for the remote console, which is in our case VNC but the browser doesn't really understand it. The browser understands HTTP or WebSocket. Uh, so to make it work, you need something in the middle that will do translate and transmission. Uh, looks like that. So you translate, uh, translate and transmit from two points in both direction, A and B. When A is ready to read, B is ready to write, do the transmission, and vice versa, the opposite direction. And the implementation is this, it's done by sockets. Those are European ones, I'm sorry. <laughs> I brought the converter, but I cannot show you because I'm using it. <laughs> so, basically they are an abstraction around the networking stack. They operate as files, so you open them, close them, read them, write them as it will be normal files, at least in Unix systems, not Windows. So, uh, if you want to use it in Ruby, you have to require it. Uh, if you're using Rails, it's already there. Uh, here I'm opening uh, an HTTP connection to the RubyConf website, sending a simple request to not HTTPS, so I'm getting back a redirect. Uh, but I assume you get what I'm doing here. So I have some writes, I have some reads, and you can see the date when I did this. So how does it work? When you write to a socket, it actually writes to a buffer, like this. When the network card is ready, because you're using other stuff as well in your network, the operating system will take this data from the buffer, form packets, and send it to the network card. It, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. It depends on how much data you write into it. It's one operation, so it takes some time. If the network card is busy, you will wait until the whole transmission happens. Reading is the same, but I was lazy to make the slides, sorry. So I think you can imagine it. There is a buffer and you wait until there is something in a buffer. These are called blocking I.O. because you wait until something is there. Uh, 
if there is no data, your, your thread will just hang and nothing will happen until you, you get the data. Of course, there is also a thing called non-blocking I.O. where you operate only with this part. So you write to the socket, you write to the buffer, and you don't care about the rest. Or the same with reading. Uh, the operations in Ruby are called write non-block, or methods in Ruby are called write non-block and read non-block. Uh, basically, they fail if the buffer is empty or full, depending on the direction. And uh, fire an exception called evil block. So if you want to do non-blocking transfer, you can make an endless loop where you uh, do the read non-block in an endless loop until it doesn't fire an exception. But it's, you probably don't want to do that. So you want to test your buffers. And for that, you can use IO select, which is a system call asking the operating system about the readiness of sockets in a time frame, for example, one second. You pass them the arrays of reads, writes, errors, and ask the operating system to wait for one second or two or however much you want, or you can wait indefinitely. Uh, it's slow, it's not performant, and it doesn't really ha handle dependencies well. And by dependencies, I mean these dependencies. Uh, when A is ready to read and B is ready to write, those are two buffers to test at the same time. But as you saw here, it returns immediately after one socket is ready. So you can have a situation like this where you have two sockets with a loop and a select. And if you look at these two lines, uh, imagine a situation where already socket A is ready for reading. The IO select will return immediately because it's ready for reading. It will go to the read part. Uh, but it will hit next because the write part isn't ready for writing, which will get back to you to the select, which is uh, uh, firing up again the ready for reading socket A. So we'll, you will end up in an endless loop, which will eat up your CPU, and you don't want to do that. Uh, as a solution, I started to think about how can we sort this out. We can use blocking I.O. with threads, or something uh, event-driven solution which magically transforms your transmissions to uh, non-blocking I.O. in a sense that will not, will not cause these issues like event machine or celluloid. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to use those libraries inside Manage IQ because we are using Postgres in an async version, which uh, fails. Uh, there is a really cool library called async, which wasn't available that time when I was working on this. If I would do uh, it right now, I would just use the async library and we would not have this talk at all. <laughs> uh, or you can write it not in Ruby, for example in Go, where you actually write blocking I.O. with Go routines and the magic happens and they plan, the compiler plans all their, your transmission into non-blocking I.O. automatically. Or I was also thinking about quitting my job. The thing I came up with is called bouncing select. And I really uh, a little bit modified my code. Uh, basically, the thing I'm doing here is dynamic arrays for the sockets to test. So as you see here, you have the instance. Do I have my pointer? Cool. You see here, you have the instance variables. And after the select, you remove them. And when you do the transmission, you push them back. So if you have a socket ready for reading, it will be removed from the array and in the next loop here, it doesn't get tested. So you end up with a non-spin lock way of the solution. Uh, of course, as I said, IO select isn't the fastest thing because you have to send all those arrays to the operating system and if you have 500 of them, you have to wait until all the 500 sockets get copied to the memory of the, which the operating system can access. So it takes some time. If you have more sockets, it's not performant. So I started to look to alternative solutions. One of them is called ePoll. Uh, it uses uh, an internal structure which to you can register your sockets uh, and then in a separate call, you can ask if one of them or more of them are ready. Uh, it's available on Linux only. BSD has something similar called KQ, uh, and I found an inter interesting uh, feature of it. If you register a socket, 
you can use uh, the EPOL one shot flag, which uh, will remove the socket from the internal structure after it gets ready. So it tests only, it guarantees you the testing only once. So basically, you will not need the first marked red two lines because uh, EPOL does it for you automatically. So it looks like this. This is not Ruby, just for the record. Uh, you register the socket uh, with some event with using EPOL CTL, and the select call is just uh, you wait for the EPOL, uh, you uh, set an array for the events and iterate through them, and based on that, you use an internal structure in Ruby to set the readiness of the sockets in the future. Simple, right? <laughs> yes. It was C. It's a C extension. It's available as a library. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, the, it only supports Linux for the moment, so I need some help with uh, Mac support. Uh, check it out, please. Try it, play with it if you have time. Uh, the other topic I would like to talk is web sockets. Those aren't normal sockets. Those are HTTP connections uh, upgraded to something more, upgraded to a bidirectional connection between the two endpoints. So basically, you have the browser and the web server, and the browser sends an HTTP upgrade request to upgrade WebSocket, and the web server sends back to you an upgrade uh, header with uh, HTTP 101. And then you can have your WebSocket frames. The HTTP server will take over uh, and do the bidirectional thing. In REC, in the Ruby world, web servers are implemented like this. You have a Lambda or a proc or whatever that responds to a call method and you return with three things in an array. The status code, the headers, and the body. This is a simple server that always returns hello world and it runs in Puma. If you have a Rails application before the array, you actually have the DHH function that will do your all middleware things and get your page based on the context which is in the nth variable. It's not really good for bidirectional stuff because any request basically just calls this function and the response is your response on the website. For that, uh, the creators of Rack implemented socket hijacking. basically kindly asking the web server to hand over the socket and don't care anymore. So in, under the hood, REC uses sockets and by using, by calling this REC hijack thing, uh, it tells REC not to use it anymore, we will care about it and just return from the Lambda call. It looks like this. It's actually a code, code snippet from our proxy. Uh, the marked line is basically the hijack. It's in the end variable. The first line is just checking for HTTP upgrade. That method is not on the slides. You have to imagine it. Uh, then I have a magic function that gives me a port and an address for the other side and open a connection, put it into the proxy, and return something dummy to make REC happy to not fire an error. This is how our consoles work. This. But the title of this topic was uh, Smuggling TCP, so uh, I'm going to continue. <laughs> I was looking at this upgrade request for a short while, and I was thinking, would it be possible to upgrade to something else? And the answer is yes. So, <laughs> if you can upgrade to anything else, you are basically able to hijack the socket and then uh, use it for your own uh, whatever protocol you want to use, which in our case was VNC. And my plan was to use a desktop application, which is way faster than a browser, to connect through the browser to a remote endpoint. Something like this. So on the server side, you would have the server proxy. On the client side, a client proxy. And they, they will translate into some language which they can understand and uh, it will start with HTTP hijacking, so it will, could get through a server easily 
bypassing any firewall that blocks anything else than HTTP. So basically, PER is HTTP upgrade and VNC, or SSH, or name your favorite protocol, VPN. Uh, I did a proof of concept with a browser plugin. So if you uh, try to access the console, let's say from our application in the future, you will get a response to talk to PER. The browser activates the PER plugin. The plugin starts to listen on a local host 333, displays this local host 333, so you can actually uh, open in your favorite client the local host 333, which will connect to the plugin. The plugin will send an HTTP upgrade request to the server, which goes actually to the proxy. So it looks like this. <laughs> the proxy sends back the HTTP 101, and you have your per connection. Uh, the proxy opens the VNC on the other side, and basically you have this nice tunnel between your client and your VM in a native console through HTTP. I have stickers. <laughs> so the architecture is uh, kind of complex for now. Uh, the server is written in Rack and Ruby. It uses the bouncing select. The plugin is uh, a web extensions plugin in JavaScript, which calls uh, the browser's native messaging API with a binary, which actually listens to the server. Uh, the binary is basically the reverse version of the server written in Go. And there is a front-end library missing because I didn't like writing JavaScript. <laughs> so if you would like to help, please. The server looks like this. You just pass a lambda, uh, pass a block to per server, and you have to implement your own magic function to return with the host and the port, and that will be the remote endpoint of your server. Then you run it with Rack, as any other web server. The advantages and disadvantages are that it behaves like HTTP, so you can use all the cool stuff, cookies, routes, authentication, HTTPS, custom headers. The only downside is that you need a browser plugin for now. Actually, there is a draft in the W3C standards for opening TCP servers in the browser using JavaScript. Then you would not need the plugin and the binary at all. It's not fully done and not ready for production, <laughs> but I have a demo, which is live. So uh, here is this virtual machine where I'm setting up a CentOS box with Docker uh, and two containers. One of them runs VNC, a VNC server. The other one runs an SSH server. Uh, I'm installing Ruby and Puma. and uh, not exposing any port of the container, so only the VM can access the containers. The VM will also run per with this code. So based on the URL, if it's VNC or SSH, it will send you to the VNC server and its port, or the SSH server and its port. Uh, and I have a static website, which looks like this. Uh, uh, those are event dispatches because I like the front end library which will send you, which open you per requests, pun intended, uh, to the remote endpoint based on what you want to try. Uh, the server is actually up and running, so I have the provision container. I can actually SSH to the VM and show you that uh, I can ping these addresses. but I cannot ping uh, them from here. The container is inaccessible. So uh, let's run the server. Yeah, let's start the VNC server. I have a VNC client here. There you go. A 
as dry as SSH in the same time, of course. So I'm localhost root. I have my key there on the container. So I just have to accept the key and I'm there. Thank you. I have stickers of those.